Hi everyone, we'll start in about two minutes as we continue our study of the uh, New Testament book of Hebrews. We're moving on to chapter 8 tonight. Um, I, this book, I like this chapter and uh, a lot of uh, Old Testament background to go through this evening. Uh, so uh, leave your comments, uh, greetings, uh, prayer requests, uh, questions, thoughts, ideas, uh, just let me know. And we'll start soon. Hi there, Pastor Chuck. I hope you're having a good day. It's been chilly. Hi, Rita. I hope you're doing well today. Terry and Deb and Linda, hello. Glad you're here this evening. Hi, Betty. Glad you're here, too. Hi, Marilyn and John. Glad you're here. Anne, welcome. We'll start shortly. All right. My uh, computer tells me it's 9 p.m., so let's pray. Uh, Father, your word brings your life. It brings salvation and peace and hope, all because it proclaims Jesus, our great high priest, who was himself the perfect sacrifice for our sins. We pray, Lord, that as we uh, come into your word's presence this evening, uh, your Holy Spirit would do the work of creating faith within us and drawing us to repentance and trust in Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray, too, that your word would empower us to share Christ with others. Tonight, Lord, our hearts are uh, drawn to uh, Brian and his family. Brian continues to be hospitalized. We pray for his healing. We think also of Steve and Sharla, who uh, are grieving the loss of Steve's dad. We pray for our country on the eve of the end of the election. We ask, Lord, that you would give your peace and uh, that we would emerge um, united, if not in agreement, but united. And, Lord, we pray, too, uh, for the witness of your church uh, however, we give witness to you interpersonally, online, in worship services, uh, in classes, however we, in personal conversations, however we share you with others, we pray that we would do so faithfully and joyfully and respectfully. Lord, send your spirit now to guide our conversation and guide my words. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I just saw your uh, note here, Rita, and we will pray. Okay, Rita says that Coulter is not gaining weight as he should. He's only in the second percentile at four months old. Pediatrician has tried what she can, recommending them take him to a GI specialist. Well, let's just pray for Coulter right now. Heavenly Father, it is... Uh, troubling when our children are sick, particularly one so little. Uh, we pray, Lord, that that the doctors and nurses and those who care for Coulter will be able to get to the bottom of things and uh, help him. And Lord, I pray that you'd give serenity and peace to Rebecca and Todd and their family. 
give them a sense of your presence and your love for them and uh, break through in whatever ways Lord, to bring uh, Coulter health in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, Rita. Hi, Ruth. Welcome. We're now on to Hebrews 8, which is a, a short chapter. It's, um, it's, in some ways, it's a culminating chapter, uh, culminating what's gone before. I neglected to include the uh, outline uh, that I've shared with you before, but at this point, we're coming into a section that runs for two and a half chapters from Matthew, or Matthew, from Hebrews 8, 1 through Hebrews 10, 18, in which we are looking at the superiority of Jesus' sacrifice over other, uh, you know, the other sacrifices that existed um, under the Jewish ritual system. And um, so this is kind of a short chapter, but um, it, uh, there's a very important quote uh, from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 31 to 34, which, by the way, is always the Old Testament lesson each year on Reformation Sunday, so, uh, or most Reformation Sundays anyway. And it's a... Uh, it's uh, it, it, it's one that talks about the new covenant that God has, is, is giving in Jesus Christ. Let's take a look here, uh, chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. Uh, this is a, a really um, kind of important couple of verses. And uh, this is the note that I've written to myself about, about these verses. Jesus, the superior high priest, um, is related here to three important things. Covenant, sanctuary, and sacrifice. All of these categories, covenant, sanctuary, sacrifice, were important to the ministry established for the descendants of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, in the Old Covenant. But, in, uh, but this new covenant that is ushered in by Jesus and that has been foreshadowed, if you will, by the priesthood of Melchizedek, who occupied our interest for the previous three chapters to a greater or lesser extent. This new covenant brought by Jesus is better than the uh, Levitical or Aaronic, A-A-R-O-N-I-C, uh, priesthood. And they bring, uh, it, Jesus brings a new covenant. He is active in a different sanctuary one fashioned by God and not by man, and in which there is a different and perfect sacrifice, which is himself. Now, I guess this is a good point, as good a point as any, to kind of um, talk about what kind of underlay all of this or undergirds what we're about to look at. Uh, we'll be looking at specific passages, but it was commonly thought among the Jews uh, of Old Testament times and even into New Testament times that the temple, particularly the throne room, duplicated 
the heavenly throne room. Um, the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem or in the tabernacle in the wilderness. You remember they, as they traveled through the wilderness, they had a tent. Um, and uh, God was believed to dwell in the Holy of Holies there. Um, but the idea is that when God gave the directions to Moses as to how the tabernacle was to be constructed, which was later mimicked uh, in the construction of the temples, there were several temples, as you know, Solomon built a temple, um, um, then the, the Herod built a temple uh, ultimately. And uh, that was destroyed in 70 A.D. <laughs> but it was believed that that, that that tabernacle replicated the tabernacle in heaven where God reigned <coughs> from his throne. And uh, we'll get into the details of that, but it's all very important here as we dig into this. Let's go on in verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. All right. Um, so that kind of makes sense. If the job of a priest is to make an offering, well, obviously the priest has to have something um, to offer. And, uh, uh, well, I'll go on in it rather than stopping and talking at every whip stitch. Verse 4, now if he were on the earth, he would not be a priest at all. This is referencing Jesus. Since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. All right. According to the Old Testament law, the priests had to be descendants of Aaron. Jesus was not a descendant of Aaron. Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, David's tribe. And we talked about this. There was, there was no tradition of a priesthood uh, or priests coming from the tribe of Judah. So when Jesus was on the earth, Jesus was a layperson who was um, of the tribe of Judah. But what the author, the preacher of Hebrews is telling us is that he had a different priesthood, the one that had been conferred on David and which uh, the Old Testament prophesied um, uh, there would be a new priest who would also be the king of the same order of Melchizedek. That's from Psalm 110. We go on. Uh, verse 5, now he's talking about the Levitical priests, these earthbound priests. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. All right, now, uh, the significance of that is this. Um, Moses was shown when he was up on the mountain with God the pattern for the tabernacle where the sacrifices would be offered by the people of God under the old covenant over which the Levitical priests, the descendants of Aaron, would preside. But he's saying that the tabernacle built by uh, human hands, whether it's the tent in the wilderness or the temple in Jerusalem, both were nothing more than copies or shadows of heavenly things. The real thing was in heaven where God uh, reigned on his throne. Take a look at Exodus 25. Uh, first of all, take a look at uh, Colossians 2.17. Colossians 2.17. Colossians 2.17. 
it says, <clears throat> talking about Old Testament law, right? He says, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So he's at, here in Colossians, Paul is saying essentially the same thing that the preacher in Hebrews has been saying, which is that everything that preceded Christ was a shadow of what was to come. The, the kingdom of God was being ushered into the world fully in Jesus. This new covenant was brought in through Jesus. The redemption of all of um, the promises that were foreshadowed in Old Testament law. Uh, all of that is past. And this is, of course, what the author in Hebrews gets at in the very first two verses of the book, when he says, in many and various ways, God spoke through his people of old through the prophets, but now in these last days has spoken by his son. Now, all those many, they were inferior. That was old. Here's the one, Jesus, the new, the superior, right? And so he's saying the same thing about the temple here back in Hebrews chapter 8, that it was a shadow of what was to come. And, you know, we talked about this before when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain in the temple between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the, the worshiping area, the sanctuary, was torn so that there was no longer uh, uh, any division between God and his people. But the significance of that runs both ways. Number one is that heaven was unleashed on the world and number two, humanity gained perfect access to God and no longer needed the old covenant. In, in his own flesh, Jesus rent asunder the old divisions and brought about the new covenant. All right, so that's the idea. I hope that makes sense. Just let me know. By the way, hi there, Matt. Glad you're here tonight, too. So uh, he's saying that was just a shadow. And then it says... Um, it, it, at the end of um, verse 5, uh, it talks about what Moses was told. Take a look at Exodus 25, verse 40. I've skipped over some stuff that I'm going to have to shore up here, but take a look at Exodus 25, verse 40. Exodus 25 is a really important uh, book of the Old Testament, because in it, um, he, God tells Moses all about the sanctuary, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, what's to be done with it, and all of that. Take a look at verse 40, Exodus 25, and see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. God was saying, follow this pattern. Why? Because this is a foreshadowing, if you will, of what is going to be ultimately revealed and given to people through Jesus Christ, this access uh, to God. Now, uh, there were other things I wanted to look at. Uh, yeah, in, in, the, in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 3, which we read just a moment ago, it talks about how the priest has to have something to offer. He does not hear in this chapter explicitly mention what it is that Jesus as our high priest offers. He does elsewhere, though. If you just slip up to uh, Hebrews 7, verse 27, um, he says, uh, he has no need, that is, Jesus has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own and then for those of other people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. So Jesus is the offering that he makes as our great high priest. And he hammers this point home again in the next chapter, Hebrews 9, verse 14. Take a look at it real quickly. Um, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, as I mentioned, all of chapter 25 in Exodus really deals with the temple and so forth. And um, 
there are several chapters I want you to look at, or several verses I want you to look at, not in, only in 25, but also in 26 and 27, that talk about the tabernacle following this visible pattern that God had given to Moses. Take a look at Exodus 25, verse 9. Exodus 25, verse 9. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture, so you shall make it. And then you go on to Exodus 26, verse 30. And it says, Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for it that you were shown on the mountain. So God is being very deliberate in telling Moses, you've got to do it this way. That's what temples did in ancient times. They replicated the vision of heaven that the people of God um, uh, believed in. And one other place, take a look at Exodus 27, verse 8. There we're told, you shall make it hollow. This is talking about the altar. You shall make it hollow with boards. Uh, as it has been shown you on the mountain, so shall it be made. Right? So uh, it, it, God was very explicit in his instructions about this. Now move on to uh, back to Hebrews 8, um, verse 6. I hope I'm not dodging around too much here. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. What does that mean? It's saying Jesus has a ministry that is as superior, um, a, a ministry that is as superior uh, as the new covenant is over the old, as, let's start all over again. Jesus has grasped hold of this ministry, this high priesthood, which is analogous in its superiority to the old priesthood, to the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. You got that, right? So it, it's saying that, that the sacrifice that Jesus offers once and for all, not only does it supplant the old um, covenant and the old sacrifices, it is superior to them because it does what the old sacrifices could not do. And it does what the old covenant could not do. And Jesus mediates that covenant as the perfect sacrifice. Um, why? Because it's enacted on better promises. And we're going to talk about what those better promises are in just a second. Um, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now, this is really important. If we could be saved by keeping the law perfectly, there would have been no need for the new covenant brought by Jesus. If the old covenant actually caused people to stop sinning and to be completely um, aligned with God, um, in other words, if people could be saved by their works, there would be no need for the new covenant that Jesus brings into being, right? Uh, why would God have gone on to bring Jesus into the picture and gone through uh, the risks involved in God taking on human flesh and being subjected to temptation and the possibility of walking away and destroying God's plan for our salvation. Why would God go through all of that if the old covenant had effectively saved people? Now, we know 
uh, Abraham and others in Old Testament times were only saved by their faith. But God had to keep reminding people and calling them back to repentance. And they had to keep sacrificing for their sins because the Old Covenant was simply not sufficient. It required a new, and I'll put it this way, final and definitive covenant. Um, uh, it, you know, it might be better to talk about the old and final covenants or the old and final testaments rather than the old and new covenant or the old and new testament. Jesus is the definitive covenant. Now, uh, at this point, we're going to have to go a little deep into the weeds here um, in Old Testament background. Because what Hebrews is going to do now is quote that passage from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Uh, and you need to know just a little bit about Jeremiah and the history of the time in which he operated as a prophet of God. I guess the first piece of background is to remember that after Solomon... David's son died, you remember that, that Israel split into two kingdoms. There was the northern kingdom, also called Samaria, also called Israel, and the southern kingdom, also called uh, Judah or Judea, the northern kingdom with its worship and civil life focused on Samaria and the southern kingdom with its worship life focused on Jerusalem. Now Galilee, which was up in the north near Samaria, still looked to Jerusalem and was, uh, you know, kind of part of God's people uh, in that way of the southern kingdom. Samaria was the first of the two to become more syncretistic, which I've talked about before. The word syncretize, it's a verb meaning basically to mix creeds, mix religious beliefs. So, okay, I'll be a little bit Buddhist, I'll be a little bit Christian, I'll be a little bit Muslim, whatever. Syncretism, which is specifically and directly contrary to the will of God, who says, I'm the Lord your God, you will have no other gods before me. And uh, the God of Israel is the only God of the world. And he brought Israel into being to become a light to the nations and bring the Savior of the world to the world in Jesus, etc., etc. Um, but the northern and southern kingdoms, um, and the northern kingdom came to be called Samaria, um, were susceptible to foreign attacks. And over the centuries, what finally happened was that Samaria was overrun and destroyed. And, you know, it never really re-emerged. There were, there were Samaritans, and they were looked down upon by the Judeans over their kind of religious pride. And because the Samaritans had been faithless, so all of that lay in the background of a lot of things you see that Jesus talks about. Uh, but the southern kingdom was increasingly involved in idolatry as well. And wherever you have idolatry, you have injustice. They go hand in hand. When people worship anything or anyone but the God revealed first to Israel and definitively in Jesus, when they worship anything but that God, injustice will always follow. Okay? So that was going on in Judea. And Jeremiah was a prophet who was first called in 628 B.C. So that gives you an idea of the time frame. And he continued until 580 B.C., so about 48 years. Um, his ministry began uh, during the reign of Josiah. Now, you may remember reading about Josiah. He was a reforming king uh, 
uh, in about 621 BC, at an, uh, we'll look at an incident um, that I'm re referencing here in just a few minutes. But in 621 BC, the priest Hilkiah found some old parchments. And they called it the Book of the Law, which we believe, many believe, I believe, was Deuteronomy. All of that had been forgotten. The Passover had been forgotten for centuries. And so uh, the scroll of Deuteronomy was read to the people, and Josiah instituted a series of reforms. They celebrated the Passover for the first time in centuries. But uh, And many people in Judea conformed to the reforms that Josiah uh, initiated, but they were only doing it in a kind of pro forma way because, you know, the king was doing it, so they were following after him. But this business of idolatry and injustice and faithlessness to God was still going on, which is why Jeremiah was called and was warning the people of Judea. Uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, with its uh, life focused on Jerusalem, that uh, God was not going to stand this forever. And that the old, you know, he kept calling them back to repentance and faithfulness to the old covenant, and they kept, kept veering away. And Jeremiah then prophesies in the 31st chapter of his book that God is going to make a new covenant. Um, which Hebrews suggest and we believe was brought into being by Jesus. Now, um, I see Anne's made a comment or a question here, so I want to pay attention to that. If there's to be a temple in heaven, might the curtain be already torn so we can see God? Now, in heaven, you will see God face to face. Um, no two ways about that. And... Um, we even see him now through a glass darkly because we still look at him through the flesh, our fallen flesh that has not yet been raised from the dead. But we do have access to God. That's why Jesus tells us to pray in his name, right? And that's kind of the point here. He is our perfect mediator, as, uh, as uh, chapter 8 would put it, right? Hebrews would put it. So we, yeah, the curtain is torn and we can see God through Jesus Christ. This is why you've heard me say this before. This is why uh, Luther talks about in Jesus, we see God's friendly face. Absolutely. All right. So uh, now he's going to get into quoting uh, Jeremiah, but I want to, I want you to take a look at these two background passages before we dig into it, and then it'll be like kind of rolling down a hill from there. But let's take a look at it. 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23. And I'm going to go right to the beginning of chapter 23. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him. And the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests, and the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, or the book of the law that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people joined in the covenant. So picture this. Um, they found the book of Deuteronomy. No one had read it or seen it for centuries. It had just been tucked away. And uh, they'd been doing some repairs. And while they were doing the repairs, Hilkiah the priest found this book and read God's commandments 
and the provisions for a sacrificial system and the Levitical priesthood and and the Passover and all of that. And Josiah is cut to the heart because they've been they've been wandering along like people in the wilderness, even though they were in the promised land. They had this points out the importance of continuously coming back to the word of God, right? And all they had was kind of this musty oral tradition that may or may not have measured up to the word of God as given to Moses. And so cut to the quick, Josiah says, we're, we're going to do this. Uh, well, we all make good uh, intentions, but Josiah is a good man. Verse 4 there in uh, 2 Kings 23, verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, Baal for Asherah, for all the host of heaven. In other words, there were in the temple in Jerusalem because of their ignorance of God's word. They had uh, uh, things devoted to these foreign deities. They weren't worshiping God, right? They had grown far from God. This was this all really goes back to Solomon because Solomon began allowing the worship of foreign deities, you know, through all of his foreign wives and and concubines. He went along with it because he was after earthly power. Solomon, who started out with the wisdom of God and still was wise in his old age, nonetheless became cynical in that wisdom in his <coughs> old age. <coughs> And, you know, it was just about the politics of things. And so Josiah says, uh, or Josiah does this in the middle of uh, verse uh, uh, four. He burned them, all of these things devoted to these foreign idols. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley, a very valley that Jesus centuries later would walk through to get to Jerusalem before he sacrificed himself on the cross and carried their ashes to Bethel. Bethel, the place where you remember Jacob uh, had the vision of, this, of, this, of the ladder up to heaven, the angels going up and down on the ladder. And he said, this is a holy place and named it Bethel, house of God. And he, Josiah, deposed the priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to make offerings in the high places at the cities of Judah and around Jerusalem. In other words, he deposed all of the priests that had been appointed uh, to make uh, the sacrificial offerings to these foreign deities. And on and on it goes. And the whole chapter of 2 Kings 23 is really an interesting read. And then you get into verse 21 of that chapter, and that's where he... Uh, restores the Passover. So um, this lay in the background of it, 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 it's uh, about the time of Jeremiah and uh, but still the people are attracted to these foreign deities. Jer <clears throat> Jeremiah was often warning the people about their idolatries and injustice. Take a look at Jeremiah 7 beginning at verse 23. And I hope I answered your question. Jeremiah chapter 7, beginning at verse 23. And we're going to read four verses here. Jeremiah 27, beginning at verse 23, it says, no, we're not, Mark 7, 23, mm. Jeremiah 7, I wondered why it didn't look familiar. But this command I gave them, this is Jeremiah, obey my voice, or God is speaking through Jeremiah, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. 
but they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I've persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day, yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. And then God, in the next verse, commands Jeremiah to tell the people to repent and come back to him. Now, this, uh, you know, is what Hebrews echoes when it says all in those under the old covenant, God kept sending prophets uh, to speak his word. There was nothing wrong with his word, but the people wouldn't listen. It didn't take hold and they couldn't keep the covenant. And that's why God, out of his abundant amazing grace and mercy decided to establish a new covenant, a different covenant. And that's the covenant that Jeremiah talks about in chapter 31. Now let's go back to Hebrews 8 and we'll see his quotation of, um, of uh, this passage in Jeremiah that, remember, he always quotes from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. So here we go. Verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them, that is, with the old covenant, when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So notice he's, um, even though the northern kingdom is already dead, Israel, God is going to make a new covenant with them, with Israel and Judah, and through them with the whole world. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and, I so, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me. This goes back to your question, Anne. They shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So, here in approximately the 7th century B.C., God is telling his people and the world through the prophet Jeremiah that I had this old covenant with my people, but they were incapable of keeping it. But I'm going to be merciful toward them and I'm going to forgive their sins. I'm not going to remember their sins. How am I going to do this? I'm going to create this new covenant in which God's law, God's will is written into their hearts. And uh, I will be their God. In other words, it's not going to be in any way contingent on the activities of the people. I'm going to do it all for you. Jesus is the one who obeys God's law perfectly and by the power of the Holy Spirit plants his word in us. He is the one. He sends the spirit who claims us to be his own people and God to be our God. And we know him, and this goes back to your question, Anne. We have 
an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And because of that, we know God. And you can see why, going down many centuries beyond that to the 16th century, why Luther's Reformation was so important. Because there is an impulse that exists in human beings toward religion and power. And what had happened in the medieval church, the church of Luther's day, was that uh, priests and theologians who saw themselves, and monks, who saw themselves as being different in God's kingdom in status rather than in function, told people what God uh, meant and didn't allow them to read the, the scriptures in their own language and didn't allow them to take uh, both elements of communion and didn't allow them da 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 In other words, they turned salvation into something to be earned. And in that sense, they blasphemed God because in Jesus Christ, the new covenant has been unleashed on the world in which each of us can know God for ourselves through his word, through the sacraments, through the communion of saints, right? And so this is the covenant, the new covenant to which Jeremiah was pointing. And what the preacher in Hebrews is saying is that Jesus is the fulfillment of that new covenant. He brings the better promises. There are three elements in this new covenant of which Jesus is the perfect priest and mediator. Three elements. One is that God's law is planted in the hearts of believers. Take a look at Ezekiel eleven nineteen. Ezekiel, which comes just shortly after Jeremiah, go to Lamentations, and then it's Ezekiel 11, verse 19. And forward a little bit. And I will give them one heart <coughs> and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. <coughs> that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. What happens? Jesus obeys the law for us. He takes up residence within us. That's what this, this prophecy in Jeremiah is about. You haven't been very good at keeping the law, Jeremiah says, hmm? or God says through Jeremiah. And I'm going to put my law in your hearts. Who is that? Jesus, the one who perfectly keeps the law and who has perfectly atoned for our inability to keep the law. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, it goes on in Ezekiel. But as for those whose heart goes after their detestable things and their abominations, that is, idols, I will bring their deeds upon their own heads. Our deeds do not come upon our heads. Here's the thing. Just as our deeds, our works, cannot save us, when we belong to Christ, our deeds and our works cannot condemn us because we are covered in Jesus and he fills us. So that's the first promise of this new covenant, that God's law is planted in our hearts. The second is that we have this perfect uh, knowledge, or this personal knowledge rather, of God. And at Jeremiah, it's very interesting. I've talked about the... the uh, the interconnectedness of idolatry and injustice. Well, the same is true for true worship of God and the doing of justice. And Jeremiah talks about that. Take a look at Jeremiah 22, verse 15. Jeremiah 22. 
Jeremiah 22, verse 15. Do you think you are a king because you compete in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Now, cedar was a very highly sought wood. You know, it was thought to be a hoity-toity kind of thing. It was used by the wealthy. But he says, did your fathers eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? They didn't have much, but they still ate and drank and did justice and righteousness. Then it was well with him. He, God, judged the cause of the poor and the needy. Then it was well. Is not this so to know me? To do justice. In other words, if you're doing justice, there's a good chance you know God. A true justice is of God. I'm not talking about the kind of things that we talk about as justice in our world. I'm talking about the justice of God, which is filled with love and mercy and grace, abounding in steadfast love, right? Slow to anger, right? That's God's justice. And that's what is done by people who live under this new covenant. And this is why, I, and, and I'm saying this on the night before an election, I think it is so dangerous, so, so dangerous to the witness of the church for preachers and church bodies to get involved with saying, vote for this candidate, not this candidate. And you have it happening from both the left and the right sides, right? There are portions of the church uh, where the pastors and the church bodies are totally in bed with the Democratic Party. And there are other groups that are totally in bed with the Republican Party. Listen, that's nothing other than syncretism. Hmm? God is God. Don't bring him down to your human puny level by conflating God with your ideas, your political preferences. Politics is a human kind of thing. It's necessary. It's important. It's, there's nothing dishonorable intrinsically or inherently about it. But the problem is when people say, I believe in justice, therefore vote, or I believe in God, therefore vote for X party, they are blaspheming God. I, I can't put it any more bluntly than that. That is blasphemy. Now, should we try to think about political issues from a, a Christian perspective? Of course. But, number one, no law that has ever passed by Congress or a township, uh, a, trust, a group of township trustees or any other political entity is going to bring people to faith in Christ. And it is only faith in Christ that will save. You can obey all of these well-intentioned laws, which as a good citizen you should try to do, right? You can obey all of those. That's not going to save you. Works don't save you. And passing these laws won't make people who don't believe in Jesus, if we force them to do things that we think are Christian, you're not, you still will not have made them Christian because people become Christian by faith, by hearing the word of God, by hearing the word of the gospel. So justice in God's eyes has to do with how we treat each other. And you cannot impose it by law, though laws, you would hope, reflect true justice. <clears throat> But none of us on this earth will get that perfectly. Nonetheless, the closer we walk with Jesus, the more justly, the more lovingly, the more charitably we will treat one another. And that's God's justice. Now, does God punish? Of course. God punishes those who refuse to believe, who engage in idolatry, who walk off and just scoff at God. Of course. And it's really not God judging them. They're judging themselves by turning away from God. Yeah, but that's, that's something God will sort out. Our call as Christians is to treat our neighbor with love and justice and charity. And so in the new covenant, when Jesus lives within us,
He makes possible for us to do that in ways, as we've talked about before, we may not even perceive because the Holy Spirit is working in us. And we're not thinking about, gee, how wonderful I am. We're just following Jesus and living in daily repentance and renewal. But that puts us in the new covenant and God works in us through that. And then the final thing that it does, this new covenant, is it brings the forgiveness of our sins. And what Hebrews says is that through Jesus, it's done once and for all. So we don't need to worry. If we trust in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. That's the very nature of the new covenant. Now, one last verse in Hebrews 8. In speaking of a new covenant, God, through Jeremiah, makes the first one obsolete. In other words, there's no more sacrifice, right? The, the, the one sacrifice needed has been done. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now, think of how that message would have been received by the preacher's first hearers. Remember, they are Greek-speaking Jewish Christians. They are under pressure from the Roman Empire to denounce their faith and their confession of Christ and go back to their Jewish ways because the empire regards Christianity now as a greater threat to the cohesion of their uh, authoritarian regime than they regard Judaism as being. So these people are under pressure to renounce Christ. And he's saying, look, that old thing is obsolete now. It's been rendered obsolete. It's, it's no longer necessary. It's no longer effective. Why would you turn your back on salvation? And then it says, uh, or it says earlier in the chapter, that, it, that all of that was a shadow. It was a shadow. Take a look at two other verses here before we close. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6. Paul is writing. Hold on. Mm, I may have copied it down wrong again. Hold on. Now, 2 Corinthians. Let me make sure I... 2 Corinthians 3, 6, it says, we'll slip up to verse 4, or verse 5. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Now verse 6, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not the letter, but of the Spirit. Right. So the new covenant is of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that has to do with the promise that we saw from Ezekiel. And it has to do with, you know, the idea of God planting his uh, law in our hearts. That's the Holy Spirit coming us uh, to us. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We couldn't keep the old covenant, but the Spirit living in us allows us to confess Jesus. We're covered by his sacrifice. And so we are right with God. We are righteous Verse 14 of the same chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But their minds were hardened. He's talking about his fellow Jews. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. The veil is lifted away. That goes back, and once again, to your question. The veil has been lifted away, and we have complete and total oneness with God through Jesus Christ. All right. There's, it's a short chapter, but there's a lot in there. And thank you for hanging in there with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, before we close tonight, we once more lift up to you, Brian and Coulter. We thank you that Jenny's surgery went well. We pray for um, uh, 
for Steve and Charlotte and their family as they mourn the passing of Bob. And Lord, we lift up to you our nation as we uh, sit on the eve of the election. <clears throat> Give us your guidance, your wisdom, your peace. And Lord, we pray for an end to the coronavirus pandemic, um, which we had the worst seven-day period ever. And the deaths are rising. We pray, Lord, that you will bring an end to this scourge. And I pray your blessings on each person who's involved in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope this is helpful. I hope it wasn't too scattershot. Um, and I plan on being with you tomorrow night uh, as we take a look at chapter 9. God bless.